Hello, my name is Dr. Mary Regina Boland, and I'm here to present a method to link neighborhood level covariates to COVID-19 infection patterns in Philadelphia using spatial regression. As a disclosure, I have no relevant relationships with commercial interests to disclose. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper shown here. This is also a screenshot of my co-authors as well as their affiliations uh, from the paper itself. And you can read the whole 10 page paper uh, in the AMIA proceedings. The learning objectives for today's talk are to understand the importance of separating asymptomatic versus symptomatic SARS CoV 2 positive patients. Also, to use spatial association analyses to understand neighborhood level factors associated with SARS CoV 2 positivity. First, I'd like to describe the importance of neighborhoods. This is a picture of the city of Philadelphia. Here's a couple of shots of rich neighborhoods within the Philadelphia region. So this is a picture from Gladwin, which is the sixth richest zip code in the country, and that's using house property values. And this is Chestnut Hill, which is actually in Philadelphia city proper. And it shows the average uh, home price. It's a, close to a million dollars in 2019. We can contrast this with neighborhoods that are listed as being poor or impoverished regions within the city of Philadelphia. Here's two regions uh, taken uh, from the news, and you can actually notice a couple things about these homes. One is there's very little uh, separation between the homes, therefore social distancing in times of COVID and SARS-CoV-2 uh, becomes very difficult and challenging. Secondly, there is a lot of peeled paint. There could be lead paint exposure through the, these very old buildings. Additionally, even though some of these buildings look boarded up, there do appear to be some evidence of living in the upper rooms, because again, uh, we cannot assume that people are not living in these regions. Over here, these are a little bit better kept uh, homes, but again, still, you can tell that these uh, people living here are under-resourced. So the method and purpose of our research today was to take the American Community Survey from the U.S. Census Bureau, as well as information from Open Data Philly, and combine that for a set of neighborhood level factors at the census track level. I should note here that Open Data Philly allowed us, using that resource, allowed us to get information on housing code violations, as well as violent and nonviolent crime in the city of Philadelphia. Information that's not contained readily within the American Community Survey. From Penn Medicine, we were able to extract a set of SARS-CoV-2 positive patients, as well as uh, symptomatic status. We were able to separate patients into uh, symptomatic patients, which would therefore be COVID-19 patients, or asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 positive only patients. We then were able to feed these patients, as well as this neighborhood level information, into a spatial regression model uh, with neighborhood level factors to help to explain the overall SARS-CoV-2 positivity, and also to look at the asymptomatic only to see how that differed. This allowed us to develop neighborhood level associations, which could be used in future for SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19, even resurgence planning, as well as for other future public health measures. So the overall, we first looked at all the patients together to assess SARS-CoV-2 positivity and how that played in with uh, neighborhood level characteristics. Our first step was to test for significance between each neighborhood level characteristic and SARS-CoV-2 positivity. We did this at each factor uh, on its own, and this allowed us to get a series of odds ratios as well as p-values. As you can see here, many of them were significant in the univariable setting. We then took anything significant at this univariable analysis step and included it into a larger neighborhood level factor model. So this would be our full larger adjusted model. In doing this, we ended up with the set of features here. Some of the features that were significant at the univariable level were no longer significant. And this means that some interplay between the variables is going on and the other factors that are most correlated with SARS-CoV-2 positivity at the neighborhood level are being pulled out in the model here. Four features showed up as being still statistically significant. Interestingly, two increased the risk of SARS-CoV-2 positivity and two decreased the risk of SARS-CoV-2 positivity. Things which increased risk were having at least a high school education, which was our proxy for education status, as well as the proportion of individuals event identifying as Hispanic or Latinx in a particular neighborhood increased the risk of SARS-CoV-2 positivity uh, in this neighborhood level model. Two decreased the risk, so the proportion of individuals identifying as white decreased the risk of SARS-CoV-2 positivity in that particular neighborhood, as well as the proportion of individuals receiving public assistance. 
Interestingly, living in a neighborhood receiving public assistance lowered the odds of SARS-CoV-2 positivity in the fully adjusted model. And I want to just mention briefly, because people may not be as aware of uh, public assistance, so how could public assistance lower uh, SARS-CoV-2 positivity? So public assistance includes both cash and non-cash benefits, TAMF, SNAP, to low-income families or individuals. This statement was actually taken directly from the American Community Survey and their definition as to what uh, public assistance includes. TAMF is uh, financial payments to uh, low-income families. SNAP is a supplemental nutrition assistance program. This is uh, commonly referred to as food stamps. Our hypothesis is we believe that public assistance in this adjusted model may be lowering SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates because these programs provide food and financial assistance to needy individuals and families. So while these individuals are a low income, they do have a protective effect of the public assistance if, if their low income is low enough to be able to be recipients of this public assistance. And this, in turn, could reduce their need to go out and work and go uh, during the pandemic further enabling social distancing efforts to actually be effective among these uh, low income community subpopulation, which is the, that which is receives public assistance. We're currently not 100% sure of this mechanism. Um, this again is not causal analysis. This is an association analysis in one large city, which is Philadelphia. This is our proposed explanation as to why this association in the model may be prote protective. We then looked at um, asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 positivity analysis as a subset. We subset our population based on symptomatic status. Uh, asymptomatic patients are being tested prior to outpatient surgery uh, whenever they encounter the health system. So, for example, if you were to go to an emergency room now even or during any of the time uh, during COVID, uh, you would be tested for COVID. And therefore, these results in these different populations, because these are different types of populations, and the people who walk in the emergency room and get receive outpatient surgeries are different than patients who... Uh, may just be coming in for uh, SARS-CoV tests. We perform the exact same analysis steps as outlined previously, just in the subpopulation, which is much smaller in size. Again, uh, this is showing the univariable analysis results. Uh, again, a lot was significant, a little bit fewer than the full analysis. And we took all of the factors or features that were significant at the univariable model uh, level, and we put them into a full adjusted model. And as you can see here, uh, none of these variables in this fuller model were significant. Again, we believe this is probably because of sample size. The thing that came up as most closest to being significant was the proportion of those living in a particular neighborhood or census tract that identified as Black or African American alone. I say almost significant because the p-value is 0 0.0505. <laughs> we do believe that this was a little bit underpowered due to sam smaller sample sizes uh, and but importantly, it does yield different results than the the model, which includes the symptomatic patients, showing that these are two different kinds of patient populations being affected. And also, it, it underscores the importance of separating asymptomatic from symptomatic patients. Our future work would be to expand this analysis with more recent data and to also investigate trends and how they changed or remained the same over time, which is very important with an evolving infectious disease such as COVID-19. Our overall conclusions of our study, which are that neighborhoods matter, and they're actually extremely important in public health. Public assistance may be protective against SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates, and race and ethnicity was associated with either reducing SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates, for example, with patients of um, neighborhoods with higher proportions of white individuals, or increasing SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates, for example, neighborhoods with higher proportions of Hispanic or Latinx. Also, results did seem to differ based on symptomatic status, so the neighborhoods with higher proportions of Black and African American were borderline at increased risk, and again, that p-value of 0.0505 uh, of SARS-CoV-2 positivity among asymptomatic only, whereas the uh, neighborhoods with high proportions of Hispanic or Latinx were at increased risk overall. Importantly, we want to add and underscore that race in this model is not we are not considering this as a biological variable. This association is likely to do social class and could be due to riskier jobs, which are often based on social class. For example, grocery store workers are at increased risk of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, housing conditions, as I showed earlier, the images of the different neighborhoods, more cramped housing. A lot of these features are associated with lower socioeconomic status. And as we know, socioeconomic status correlates heavily with race and ethnicity. And therefore, we believe it is an uncaptured, there are uncaptured elements within our models, uh, which are manifesting themselves as race uh, and ethnicity associations. And we need to dig into this a little bit more 
We do also want to underscore the importance of distinguishing asymptomatic from symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 positive individuals. And please read our paper for more details on this. And I would like to thank my lab as well 